Hello everyone and welcome back to my True Crime with Some channel. Today we have got an extremely um, bad one to talk about and I had it recommended to me. I can't remember by who but if you did recommend this to do this case and thank you. I did actually know about this case but I didn't know all about it so yeah it was a bit of a hard one to research but it's going to be a really long one <laughs> so strap in. And yeah, before we get started, please make sure you subscribe because it means the world to me and share my video, my channel and give it a thumbs up because it really does help me out. And thank you for your support. And also at the end, make sure you comment down below because I want to know your thoughts and opinions and your comments mean the most to me out of everything. Let's jump straight in. Today's case is on Robert Black. He is named the UK's worst paedophile serial killer. Britain's worst paedophile serial killer he's actually from scotland though so i'm not sure if i'm gonna call this like scottish serial killer i'm not too sure but that's what he's um, known as the eight year nationwide inquiry into the 1990 arrest of robert black was one of the longest most exhausting and costly british murder investigations of the 20th century that just tells you a lot we're going to jump straight into his childhood robert black was born on april 21st 1947 in grangemouth scotland his biological mother jesse hunter black she refused to put her father's name on robert's birth certificate and she just had robert fostered basically subsequently his mum married Francis Hall. She had four more children and then died in 1982. But Robert never had any further contact with his mum or any of his half siblings and obviously he was put into care but he was eventually taken in and fostered by an older couple named Margaret and Jack Tulip near Glencoe in West Highlands. Now despite being safe saved from foster care his life was far from easy or good when robert was only five years old jack tulip his foster dad passed away jack had frequently beaten his adopted son locals later recall that they often saw robert had like bruises all over him indicating that he may have been abused by his foster parents robert would just say that he cannot recollect how he got these injuries but it is possible that these injuries were just from like being a you know clumsy child and as for margaret his foster mum she found raising robert almost impossible beginning around the age of eight robert had some he began a series of odd sexual experiments. Some of these activities included putting objects up his own rectum, which at eight years old is crazy. According to Robert himself, one of the most revealing moments from his young childhood came when he began attending primary school in the village of Kinlochleven. I'm not going to be able to say that properly, I'm sorry. And there, Robert preyed upon smaller and weaker students. Robert regularly wet the bed at night and believed that he should have been born a girl. At the age of five, Robert said that he and his schoolmates would regularly compare genitalia. Then at age eight, Robert took home one of his neighbour's children to look at her privates. This is all very young. During his childhood and acquaintances from primary school says he was a bit of a loner but he had a tendency to bully. He always preferred to spend his time with younger children and was known for committing random sudden acts of violence. He's remembered as having been a very aggressive and slightly wayward boy. He also would be getting involved in petty crime from a young age. He was very prone to tantrums and often vandalised school property. He was also a target for bullying among children his own age but he was was the bully towards younger children. Robert also cared very little for his own hygiene, which earned him the nickname as Smelly Bobby Tulip among his classmates, which is not nice, but he's not nice either, so. Robert could chill his classmates' blood, even at the age of 11. Fellow pupil John McIntosh, who's now 64, said, quote, there was something in his eyes, they would go right through you. I can still remember the stare he would give you if you got on the wrong side of him. It was unnerving. He was sleek kit looking. It was obvious even then that he had a bad streak in him. Which is crazy that this 64 year old remembers. He obviously left like a proper mark in his head. So Robert Black lived with the Tulips, well his foster mum, until 1958. However, 
by 1958 both of the parents had died by now and he was placed with another family in another place in Scotland. Shortly after he was placed with this new family he committed his first known sexual assault. He dragged a young girl into a public lavatory and sexually fondled her and when his foster mother somehow learned about this incident she reported this offence to the social worker and insisted that Robert be placed in alternative accommodation like you just would not want that boy in your house which I get. Robert was then placed in a mixed sex children's home on the outskirts of Falkirk and more worrying than his love for violence was his obsession for sex. Now I don't know why they put him in a mixed sex home but yeah this obviously was not a good idea because in this mixed sex children home Robert would regularly expose himself to girls and on one occasion he forcibly removed the underwear from a girl. At age 12 he and two other boys attacked a young girl while they while she was walking alone in a field near this orphanage. Each boy tried to put their penis into this young girl but they failed to get an erection. None of these three boys were charged with any crime unbelievably but as a result Robert was sent to a different place called Red House Care Home, which is a high discipline, all male establishment. And he literally was known as just boy number 28, like just listed as number 28. And at this location, Robert was actually repeatedly sexually abused by a male staff member for three years, typically by being forced to perform oral sex on him. During this time, he studied at Musselboro Grammar School, developing an interest in football and swimming. And other students recalled him as being very reserved with very few friends. In 1963, at age 15, Robert left the Red House care home with assistance from child welfare agencies. He moved to Greenock where he found lodgings in another boy's home and got a job as a butcher's delivery boy. And he actually later admitted that while on his rounds delivering, if he discovered a young girl alone in a home to which he made a delivery to, he would sexually fondle her before leaving the premises. And he's estimated to, during this time, have molested about 30 to 40 girls in this manner. But none of, none of these incidents were reported, so we don't actually know if it's true or not. Robert's first conviction was at the age of 17 in the summer of 1963. He was charged with lewd behaviour. He encountered a seven-year-old girl playing alone in a park. He lured the child to a deserted air raid shelter on the pretext of showing her some kittens. Once the girl was inside the deserted building, Robert began choking her until she lost consciousness. With the girl helpless on the ground, Robert masturbated over her. After finishing, he walked off as if nothing was wrong. The girl managed to survive and she was later found that day. Before his court appearance on the 25th of June, Robert was subject to a psychiatric examination. And the official report was that basically this was an isolated offence, like a one-off and that he was not in need of further treatment. And as a result, he was admonished for the offence. Charged with lewd behaviour, lewd behaviour for literally sexually assaulting a seven year old. Oh my God. Shortly after this, Robert moved to Grangemouth where he lodged with an elderly couple and got a job with a builder's supply company. He began dating Pamela Hodgson, a young woman he had met at a local youth club. Pamela was his only known girlfriend and they dated for several months and according to Robert he had actually asked Pamela to marry him and she said no and he was absolutely devastated because she just ended the relationship and this was in part to Pamela not really liking his unusual sexual demands. In 1966, Robert's inappropriate manifestations of sexual desires resurfaced when he molested his landlord and landlady's nine-year-old granddaughter. The girl eventually told her parents, however, they took no legal action, but obviously Robert was ordered to leave the house. At this time, Robert moved to Kinloch Leven. I know I'm not saying that right. So he went back to where he, you know, grew up, where he was raised. And he took a room with a couple. So they were like renting out the room. And this couple had a seven year old daughter. Just like before, Robert molested this girl as well. This time, however, when the sexual abuse was discovered, the police were notified and Robert was eventually sentenced to a year of Borstal Training, which is a type of youth detention centre at Pullmont. He stayed at this rehabilitation centre until 1968. After that, this budding serial killer moved to London. Quite quite the move. So on September 1968, six months after his release from 
Cormont Ballstall. Like I said, Robert left Scotland and moved to London, where he initially found lodgings in a bedsit close to King's Cross Station. Between 1968 and 1970, he supported himself through various, often casual jobs. One of these was being a lifeguard at Hornsney Swimming Pool. However, Robert was soon fired from his job for sexually fondling a young girl, but no charges were brought against him. While living in London, Robert began to collect child pornography, with much of it being bought from a contact that he met at King's Cross Bookshop. At first, this material was in magazine and photographic format. He then expanded his collection to include videos with graphic child sexual abuse. Robert himself was also a keen photographer, and he actually liked to discreetly photograph children back when he worked at, as a lifeguard at the pool. And he stored these images that he took and this pornographic material he collected inside locked suitcases. And most of these photos and content of these children were between eight and 12 years old. In his free time, Robert frequented the free Browns, a Stamford Hill pub, where he became known as a proficient darts player. At the pub, he also met a Scottish couple, Edward and Cathy Rayson. In 1972, Robert actually moved into their attic, and he was considered a responsible, if somewhat reclusive tenant who, you know, beyond his poor hygiene, gave the Raysons no calls for complaint. And Robert actually remained their lodger for years, like nearly 20 years, until his arrest in 1990. Now, this is, you know, kind of the start of it really taking a turn for the worst. To increase his scope for casual work, in the mid-1970s, Robert bought a white Fiat van to enable him to commit to driving for a living. In 1976, Robert got a permanent job as a van driver for Postar Dispatch and Storage LTD, a Hoxton-based firm whose fleet delivered posters, typically like pop star posters and billboard advertisements to locations all across the UK, Ireland and continental Europe. And to his employers, Robert was a conscientious employee who, you know, was willing to undertake the long distance journeys that other men wouldn't because they had a family at home, you know, they were married. While working as a driver, Robert gathered very thorough knowledge of the UK roads, subsequently enabling him to snatch children from across the entire country and dispose of their bodies hundreds of miles away from the original site of their abduction. To reduce the chance of being identified by anyone, you know, by eyewitnesses, Robert often adjusted his appearance by alternately growing a beard or appearing clean shaven and occasionally he would shave his head completely bald. Robert also owned a dozen pairs of glasses and he would wear a pair significantly different from those he regularly wore when abducting a child and he also covered the rear windows in his van with opaque black curtains. First murder victim, Jennifer Cardi was only nine years old when she was abducted near her home in Ballinderry, County Antrim, Northern Ireland on August 12th, 1981. Jennifer was last seen by her mother at 1.40 p.m. as she cycled to a friend's house in Ballinderry, but she never arrived. Hours later, Jennifer's bicycle was discovered less than a mile from her home and it was covered with branches and leaves. The stand on her bicycle was down, suggesting that she had stopped her bicycle to, you know, talk maybe with the abductor. And a search aided by 200 volunteers found nothing else. Six days later, two anglers found Jennifer's body in a reservoir near a lay-by in Hillsborough, 16 miles from her home. A pathologist noted signs of sexual abuse on her body and underwear and the autopsy concluded that she had died of drowning, most likely accompanied by a ligature strangulation. And the watch that Jennifer had been wearing had actually stopped at 5.50 p.m. So while Jennifer's murder and abduction initially remained unsolved, the location of her body near a major road between Belfast and Dublin led police to suspect her murderer had been familiar with the area. The reservoir in which her body was found was near a route frequented by long distance delivery drivers, suggesting that her killer may have, you know, travelled extensively upon this route. Now onto the second murder. Robert's second confirmed victim was 11-year-old Susan Clare Maxwell, who he abducted on the 30th of July 1982. 
Susan was from the village of Cornhill on Tweed on the English side of the, you know, English-Scottish border. That day, she left home to play a game of tennis across the border in Coldstream. Several local witnesses remembered seeing her until she crossed over the bridge over the River Tweed. Susan was reported missing by her mother, Elizabeth, who had driven to the tennis courts to collect her. And that's when she learned from her daughter's friends that the two had parted company outside Coldstream Police Station to walk home separately. The next day, a full-scale search was mounted, which involved police from both the English side and Scottish sides of the border, many with search dogs as well. At the peak of the search, 300 officers were assign assigned to it full-time. The search involved house-to-house -house inquiries and spread over 80 square miles of terrain. Several people did speak of seeing a white van in that local area, with one witness stating that the van had been parked in a field gateway of the A697, although they didn't know the model of the van. And we now know that around 4.15pm, a van approached Susan as she crossed the bridge. Robert was behind the wheel and he easily spotted an empty field just beyond the bridge. He parked his van and then waited for Susan to get close. On the 12th of August, Jennifer's body was found by a different lorry driver. Her body was covered with undergrowth and she was fully clothed except for her shoes and underwear and she had to be identified via dental records. The precise date and cause of her death could not be determined due to the advanced state of decomposition which is so sad. Jennifer had been bound, her mouth had been gagged with sticking plaster and her underwear had been removed and neatly folded beneath her head suggesting that she had been subjected to a sexual assault before her murder. A coroner's inquest concluded that Jennifer had died shortly after she'd been abducted. Jennifer remained in Robert's van, either alive or dead, for in excess of 24 hours, as his delivery schedule encompassed Edinburgh, Dundee, and then finally Glasgow, where he made his final scheduled delivery close to midnight on the 30th of July. The following day, Robert returned from Glasgow to London, discarding the body beside the A518 near Utoxeter. 264 miles from where this poor little girl had been abducted. All that, that is ages. Now on to the third murder. Five year old Carolyn Hogg was Robert's youngest known victim. She disappeared while playing outside her Beach Lane home in the Edinburgh suburb of Portobello in the early evening of 8th of July, 1983. When she failed to return home by 7.15 p.m., her parents and brother briefly searched the surrounding streets where they encountered a boy of Carolyn's age. This boy informed the Hogs that he'd recently seen their daughter in the company of a man on the nearby promenade. This obviously caused the Hogs to get become frantic. They searched the promenade, but then they reported Carolyn missing to the police. Police launched an intense search for Carolyn Hogg and at that time was the largest conducted in Scottish history. The efforts to find Carolyn saw 2,000 local volunteers. This missing child inquiry also saw massive media coverage and by 10th of July her disappearance was headlining the news. Nine known paedophiles were identified as having been in Portobello on the evening of Carolyn's disappearance but all were eliminated from the inquiry. Numerous eyewitnesses had seen an unkempt, balding, furtive-looking man wearing horn-rimmed glasses watching Carolyn as she played in the playground. He had then followed her as she left the playground to walk to Fun City, which is a nearby fairground. En route, Jennifer Booth, a 14-year-old girl, saw Carolyn sitting on a beach in this man's company. And she obviously just assumed the pair to be father and daughter. And she overheard Carolyn actually reply, quote, yes please, to obviously something Robert had said to her. And then they walked to the fairground holding hands. At Fun City, the same man had paid 15 pence for Carolyn to ride a children's carousel as he stood and watched her. Carolyn then left the fun fair in his company and according to one child who had witnessed her leave the fair, she seemed frightened. Evidence later found concluded that Carolyn remained in Robert's van for a minimum of 24 hours her precise day and cause of death remains unknown, but Robert made a scheduled delivery of posters to Glasgow several hours after the abduction and refueled his van in Carlisle in the early hours of the following morning. On 18th of July, poor little Susan's naked body was found discarded in a ditch close to the M1 motorway in Twycross. 310 miles from where she'd been abducted and only 24 miles from where Susan Maxwell's body had been found 
the previous year. Now the precise cause of Caroline's death could not be discovered due to the extent of decomposition. The ontologist who examined the body thought that the body could not have been placed where she was found before the 12th of July, leaving a possibility that Robert had disposed of it as, she, as he made a delivery to Bedworth on that day. And obviously the absence of her clothing led them to maybe like 100% know that this was sexually motivated. Now after the discovery of Carolyn Hogg's body, a conference of senior Staffordshire and Leicestershire detectives concluded that Caroline Hoggs and Susan Maxwell's murderers were the same person, so they linked them. And this was mainly because of the distance between the abductions and the discovery sites. Jennifer Carley's murder in Northern Ireland was not linked at all to this, these two girls, until 2009. Now, due to the distances involved, Police suspected that the murderer possibly worked as a long distance lorry driver or a sales representative. Both girls had been bound and very, very likely sexually assaulted before their murders and each girl had been wearing white ankle socks at the time of her abduction, which may have triggered a fetish in the perpetrator's psyche. They concluded that due to the geographical and circumstantial nature of the offences, that this perpetrator was an opportunist. Something interesting is based upon the day of the week that the girls had been abducted, which was a Friday both times, the killer was likely tied to a delivery or production schedule. Following the August 1982 discovery of Susan Maxwell's body, numerous transport firms with links between Scotland and the Midlands of England were contacted and drivers were questioned about the whereabouts on the date of her abduction. This line of inquiry was repeated following the discovery of Carolyn Hogg's body, but both times they didn't get anyone. It didn't help. Despite frustration at the lack of a breakthrough in their search for the murderer, there was a complete cooperation between the detectives and the four police forces involved in the manhunt. So they, you know, they were really trying. Fourth murder. By early 1987, all information regarding the murders had been inserted into the revolutionary Holmes Information Technology System. But sadly, all the police forces in the UK that were part of this did not manage to stop Robert Black from murdering again. On Wednesday, March 26th, 1986, Sarah Harper, aged 10, went to K&M stores to buy a loaf of bread and some potato chips near her home in Morley in Leeds. The owner of the shop later said to the police, that Sarah had left the shop at 7.55pm. Sarah Hop was last seen alive by two girls walking into an alley leading towards her Brunswick Place home. When Sarah had not returned home by 8.20pm, her mother Jackie and sister briefly searched the surrounding streets before Jackie reported her daughter missing to West Yorkshire Police. Immediately, an extensive search was launched to find the child. Over 100 police officers were, were assigned full-time to the search. This saw house-to-house -house inquiries all over Morley, over 3,000 properties searched, more than 10,000 leaflets distributed, and 1,400 witness statements obtained. A police search of the surrounding area was bolstered by 200 local volunteers and a reservoir in nearby Tingley was searched by underwater units. So this was an extensive search. Extensive inquiries by West Yorkshire Police established that a white Ford Transit van had been in the area where Sarah had been abducted. Two suspicious men had been seen loitering near the route that Sarah had, would have been taken and one of these men was stocky and balding. Mindful of the possibility that Sarah could have been abducted, West Yorkshire Police dispatched a telex to all forces nationwide, requesting that they search all locations where they had previously discovered child murder victims. On the 19th of April, a man discovered Sarah's partially dressed, gagged and bound body floating in the River Trent near Nottingham, 71 miles from the site of her abduction. An autopsy showed that she had died between five and eight hours after her abduction and that the cause of her death was from drowning, injuries that she'd re received to her face, forehead, head and neck had most likely rendered her unconscious prior to being thrown into the water. Sarah had also been the victim of a violent sexual assault prior to being thrown into the river, causing pre-mortem internal injuries which were described by the pathologist as, as simply terrible. Days after Sarah's body was found, a further witness contacted West Yorkshire Police to say that at approximately 9.15pm on the 26th of March, he had seen a white van with a stocky, balding man standing by a passenger door parked close to the river saw. This description 
matched very closely to what eyewitnesses around the area saw as well. So investigators took this eyewitness account very seriously. Robert Black had actually refuelled his van in Newport Pagnell the following afternoon. And it is likely that he had driven Sarah to Ratcliffe on Saw and discarded her body in the Saw in the late evening of the date of her abduction or the early hours of the following day. Realising the likelihood that Sarah's murderer had travelled on the M1 motorway prior to disposing of her body in the river and that he would have had to refuel his vehicle to have made this journey, officers from both West Yorkshire and Nottinghamshire Police questioned staff and motorists at all service stations on the M1 motorway between Woolley, West Yorkshire and Trow, asking whether they had noted anything unusual on the 26th or 27th of March. Staff at one station noted a white transit van which seemed out of place on the evening of 26th of March but could not give a clear description of the driver. Following the murder of Sarah Harper, with six police forces now involved in the hunt for this offender, the police forces involved in the manhunt agreed that Hector Clark... Hector Clark was at this time a detective chief constable of the Lothian and Borders Police. They agreed that Hector Clark should maintain overall command for the investigation. Clark created a new headquarters in Wakefield to act as a, as a liaison between the six forces. There was obviously lots of meetings always about this. It was, this was a huge, huge manhunt. Like they, it, it had been going on for a long time and they needed to you know, get this man. And one of the outcomes of one of these meetings was that they contact the FBI to get a, you know, psychological profile for UK investigators. And the FBI actually completed this profile in early 1988. Investigators concluded only those with convictions for serious sexual offences against children warrant further investigation. Every police force in the UK was asked to check their database for people that received convictions for any of these offences within 10 years of the 1982 murder of Susan Maxwell. This narrowed the number of people to be checked to 40,000 men and Robert Black's name was not on the list as his main conviction had been in 1967, which is so stupid. Why didn't they just Oh. Back to the FBI's psychological profile. This profile described the killer as a white male aged between 30 to 40 years old, likely closer to 40, who was a classic loner. This offender would be unkempt in appearance and would have received less than 12 years of formal education. He likely lived alone in rented accommodation in a lower middle class neighbourhood. This profile also deduced that the motive for the child killings was sexual and the offender held a fixation with child pornography and he retained souvenirs from his victims and he most likely engaged in necrophilia with his victims' bodies shortly after their death before disposing of them. I find it so clever how they can come up with this psychological profile because this literally is Robert. Like, they wrote Robert. It's crazy how they are so clever to come up with this. On to another victim. Thank God, though survived but still a victim nonetheless an attempted abduction of Teresa Thornhill on the 23rd of April 1988 an attempted abduction of teenage girl occurred in the Nottingham district of Radford which was not initially deemed by Nottinghamshire police to be linked to these other three child killings and thus remained unreported to Clark who obviously was you know the head of all of this in the in the national manhunt this was despite the fact that all constables around the UK had been requested to report incidents of this nature to the inquiry team, but it was not. But, oh my god. So, the victim of the attempted abduction was Teresa Thornhill, a 15 year old who was 4 for 11, which may have obviously led Robert to believe that she was younger than she actually is, because obviously we know he prefers much younger children than 15 year olds, but she looked very, very young. On the evening of Sunday, April 24th, Teresa was walking through the Radford area of Nottingham with a friend, Andrew Beeston. It was then that they spotted a blue Ford Transit van driving suspiciously. After she and Andrew went their separate ways at a crossroad, Teresa again saw the vehicle. This time, parked up in front of her in Norton Street, the driver got out and opened the bonnet and shouted at the girl. Feeling uneasy, Teresa crossed to the other side of the road. Again, the driver, which we know now is Robert Black, shouted, can you fix engines? And next thing Teresa knew, she had been grabbed from behind by Robert in a tight bear hug. He tried to drag her over to his van. In Teresa's efforts to escape, she bit Robert on the hand and arm and knocked off his glasses. He thrust his hand over her nose and mouth and tried to push her into the van door. Teresa, stronger than she looked, resisted fiercely, wedging her feet up either side of the door frame and refusing to go in. Robert then said, get in you bitch. But he could not manage to push her through. Teresa later told police, quote, I was fighting for my life. As the struggle continued, Teresa's friend Andrew 
actually heard her cries for help and came running to the scene. Robert finally let go of Teresa and the two of them ran away as the killer sped off in his van. During his trial, it actually emerged that Robert had made a delivery just 500 yards from the scene of the attempted abduction that day. Both Teresa and Andrew ran to Teresa's home and informed her parents what had occurred. And they immediately reported this to the Nottinghamshire police who questioned both youngsters. Both described the perpetrator as an overweight, balding and heavy built man aged between 40 and 50 and about five foot seven in height. So guys, finally, we're gonna be talking about Robert's arrest. You can see I'm smiling. Oh, right, so Robert Black was finally arrested in Stowe on the 14th of July, 1990. David Herx, a 53 year old retired postmaster, was mowing his front garden and saw a blue transit van slow to a standstill across the road from his house. The driver exited his van and started to clean his window screen as the six year old daughter of David Herx's neighbours passed his field of view. As David stopped to clear grass cuttings from his lawnmower, he noticed the little girl's feet lifting from the pavement. David then straightened his back to observe the vehicle's driver hastily pushing someone through the passenger door before clambering across the driver's seat, closing the passenger door and then starting the engine. Instantly realising that a child kidnapping was in progress in front of his own eyes, David noted the registration of the van as the driver rapidly made a three point turn and accelerated from the scene. David ran to the home of this little girl and informed her mother of what he'd just seen. The girl's mother immediately called the police. Within minutes, six police vehicles had arrived in the village where they were met by David and the girl's distraught mother. When police began questioning David outside his house, he relayed a description of the van before giving officers the vehicle's registration number, which is so lucky he realised what was going on. As David talked with these officers, he observed the same van driving in their direction and, it, and shouted, that's him, that's the same van. Immediately upon hearing this, one officer jumped in front of this van, forcing the driver to swerve and break to a halt. This officer and his, and his colleagues at the scene removed the van driver from his seat and handcuffed him as they straddled him face down on the pavement. Now this is, this actually is crazy to me when I read this. One of the officers who had raced the scene of this abduction was actually the father of the abducted child. Can you imagine that? Being one of the police officers, it's your ch oh my god. And as Robert was actually being restrained by his colleagues, this officer, who was the dad of the little girl, opened the rear doors of the van and clambered inside, calling his daughter's name, before seeing movement in a sleeping bag near the partition separating the rear of the van from the driver's compartment. The girl's father then untied the drawstrings, sealing the bag to discover his daughter with her wrists bound behind her back, her legs tied together, her mouth bound and gagged with sticking plaster and a hood tied over her head. Upon removing his daughter from the van, the father of this child and the officer turned to Robert and exclaimed, quote, that's my daughter, you bastard. I would have done a lot more than that but, you know, he's a policeman, he's got to stay. Robert was then taken to Selkirk Police Station. En route, he informed a sergeant, quote, it was a rush of blood to the head. I have always liked little girls since I was a lad. I tied her up because I wanted to keep her until I dropped a parcel off. I was gonna let her go. Robert then claimed he had only interfered with his victim a little before his capture. Oh my God, sick, sick, twisted. Really sadly, sh shortly after she was, thank God rescued this little girl, the child victim of this abduction was examined by a doctor who discovered that she had been subjected to serious sexual abuse. This little girl was able to pinpoint the lay-by on the A7 where Robert Black had sexually assaulted her before returning to Stow. Now, Robert's intentions had been to quickly make a final scheduled delivery to Gala Shields before further abusing and almost certainly we know that he would have killed this little girl. At the police station, Robert was obviously questioned and he said that the nature of this assault had been limited because he didn't have much time with the child. Oh my God. Now, upon completing this interview, Robert was charged with abduction. Remember, they don't know that he's done anything like this before, so he's just charged with abduction right now. However, as Robert was awaiting his scheduled 16th of July trial, the detective superintendent realised the similarities between this Stowe abduction and the three child killings and he notified Hector Clarks of Robert's arrest. On the 16th of July, Clark travelled from Wakefield to briefly interview Robert at Edinburgh's St. Leonard's police station. Although the answers Clark received from this brief interview weren't much use, Robert was just not helpful, he did leave the interview feeling that Robert Black was the man that he had been trying to get 
since 1982. Robert's initial remand saw him ordered to stand trial at Edinburgh High Court for the abduction of the little girl from Stowe. He was then transferred to Salton Prison. A search of Robert's impounded transit van found numerous instruments which were used as restraining devices including assorted ropes, sit sticking plaster and hoods. Investigators also discovered a Polaroid camera, numerous articles of girls clothing, a mattress and a selection of sexual aids. Now when Robert was asked to explain what the items were and why he had them, Robert explained that on his long distance deliveries he had been in the habit of pulling over to a lay-by and dressing in the children's clothing before masturbating but he was unable to give a plausible explanation for everything else. Now what's really weird is the clothing, the kid, the little girl's clothing that was recovered from his van was not found to be any of his victims clothing which I find bizarre like where did you get that from? They then discovered all of his just tons of illegal child pornography sexual abuse on child photos and, and they actually even found this is this really oof, they found a semen stained newspaper clipping detailing the 1988 attempted abduction of Teresa Thornhill. Prior to Robert's scheduled trial his defence lawyer Herbert Kerrigan ordered that he undergo a psychiatric evaluation. Assessments were done by eminent psychiatrists and both rep reports were uncompromising regarding his deviancy towards children. In his pre-trial consultations with Herbert Kerrigan, Robert informed his lawyer of his intention to plead guilty to the abduction charges. So, Robert's abduction trial for that little girl. On the 10th of August 1990, Robert was tried for the abduction and sexual assault of the Stowe schoolgirl. This trial literally just lasted one day and obviously the opening statement from behalf of the defence said that Robert wishes to plead guilty to the abduction. The prosecution were basically saying that the things they found in Robert's van was a clear sign of premeditation. They just went through what happened, that he took her to a lay-by and yeah. Robert's defence repeatedly insisted that this had been a completely unplanned event and that he had intended to release the girl after assaulting her. He further stated that his client freely admitted to his paedophilic preferences and his claims to have successfully fought against the urge to abduct young girls prior to the incident. Finally, he argued that Robert accepted that he was a danger to children and wished to undergo treatment. Prior to sentencing, Judge Ross paid tribute to David Herx, whose vigilance had been responsible for Robert Black's arrest, sentencing Robert to a term of life imprisonment for what he described as, quote, a horrific, appalling case. Judge Ross said that the sentence was greatly influenced by the opinion of both psychiatrists who had concluded that Robert was and would remain an extreme danger to children. In September 1990, Robert announced his intention to file notice of appeal against his life sentence. He later abandoned his appeal because he was given advice by his lawyers to not bother and in November 1990 he was transferred to Peterhead Prison to continue his sentence. So, two weeks after the trial for the abduction, of that schoolgirl. Clark travelled again to visit Robert Black and he appointed two officers to do the interview with instructions that they were to inform Robert from the onset that they were not judgmental from anything he chose to divulge in. In this six hour long interview Robert freely discussed his early sexual experiences, his experimentation, his experimentation in various forms of self abuse and his attraction towards young children. He also described his habit for wearing young children's clothing and he told them that he had sexually assaulted in excess of 30 young girls between the 1960s and 1980s. Any questions these officers asked pertaining to the unsolved child murder cases and disappearances, Robert remained very uncommunicative. Like he just was not helpful. Later, in the interview they steer the questioning directly to the subjects of child abduction and murder, specifically in the relation to Carolyn Hogg. Now they informed Robert that police had already established that he had been in Portobello on the date of her abduction. They then tactily informed him that they had eyewitness accounts and petrol station receipts, further proving he was near Portobello on the date of Carolyn's abduction. They then produced a composite drawing of the man with whom Hogg was seen leaving with at the fun fair and they put this beside some photos of Robert from the early 1980s, highlighting the extreme similarities in them. Robert's replies became very evasive and blunt in response to anything to do with this. The interview finished with both detectives asking Robert directly to confess to end the suffering of the families of his victims. Robert did not respond to this. At the end of this, Clark informed his two colleagues, quote, 
that's our man, I'd bet my life on it. Detectives from the six forces in the UK linked to the joint manhunt then began an intense endeavour to gather sufficient evidence to convince the Crown Prosecution Service to instigate legal proceedings against Robert with a reasonable chance of securing convictions and Robert just completely refused to cooperate with the detectives in their investigation which is you know what I expected. Investigators contacted Poster Dispatch and Storage LTD which is where Robert had worked since 1976 to establish whether travel records could confirm the whereabouts of Robert on these crucial dates. They had all his petrol files and his schedules still available, thank God. And investigators discovered that each time one of these events occurred, an abduction, a murder, Robert had a scheduled delivery in that area. And although the precise times of him being in them areas were difficult to provide, petrol receipts confirmed that every time he'd bought petrol, close to where each girl had been abducted on the date of their disappearance. So he would always refuel his van like in between where he abducted the girl and then disposed of the body, if that makes sense. This was literally damning evidence. Like, yes, they didn't have DNA evidence, but this is as close as it can get. Like, this is so obvious. And also, obviously, other they did look at other people who worked their schedules, but obviously a lot of them didn't like those long distance ones, whereas Robert did, so they could kind of rule out everyone else. And by December 1990, the inquiry team decided that they had sufficient circumstantial evidence to convince the Crown that there was a reasonable prospect of securing convictions against Robert. Although Clark was worried that the inquiry had not uncovered any forensic evidence to tie him to the murders. All the evidence was submitted to the Crown in May 1991. In March 1992, Crown lawyers decided that the evidence was sufficient enough to try Robert for these three murders and the attempted abduction of Teresa Thornhill. Several pre-trial hearings were held between July 1992 and March 1994. And in these hearings, Robert's defence team were really really trying hard to get these to be tried separately so they wanted them to be not linked together at all because obviously if they are all linked together it makes him look a lot worse if that makes sense whereas if they do it separately and the tr and the jury don't know about another murder that could he could have possibly done and they just knew about this one murder then it's a lot easier to get Robert off of charges. However, the judge completely ruled against this, which was amazing. Therefore, evidence from each of these murders could be linked together, thank God. On 13th of April 1994, Robert Black stood trial before Judge William Macpherson at Moot Hall, Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Robert pleaded not guilty of the 10 charges of kidnap, murder, attempted kidnap, and preventing the lawful burial of a body. In the prosecutor's opening statement, he described this case as every parent's worst nightmare, and he outlined the prosecution's idea that Robert Black had committed the free child murders and the attempted abduction, and the similarities between these offences and the 1990 abduction and sexual assault of the Stowe schoolgirl that he was already in prison for. They then obviously outlined all of the evidence the, which, that I've spoke about, and the fact that each victim remained alive for around five hours every time in Robert's van. Can you imagine? I didn't think it could get worse, but the fact they were alive when, oh, for so long, stuck in a random man's van. Oh my God, they're so young as well. Truly, truly evil, evil man. And obviously that's quite a key thing to say, the fact that he literally would abuse them and then keep them in their van, his van and then kill them. Like, what? On the second day of the trial, the prosecution began to introduce witnesses, witness statements, circumstantial evidence and forensic testimony. Contemporary statements made by the mother of each murder victim at the time of her child's abduction were also read to the court, alongside testimony from the pathologist who had examined the bodies. Upon hearing the details of the kidnaps and murders, relatives of the three murder victims wept openly in court. Robert rarely displayed any interest throughout the proceedings, typically remaining utterly expressionless. Several of these initial witnesses were cross-examined by Robert's defence team and they were trying to like catch them out if they, you know, were like wrong on timings, trying to get them to say the wrong time, which is ridiculous. They're just completely grasping at straws here. But all the witnesses stuck to the truth and the truth was they were right. On the 4th of May, Ronald Twite, Twites, 
began to outline his case in defence of Robert. Ronald reminded the jury that police had been unsuccessfully investigating these crimes for eight years before Robert's 1990 arrest. And he basically put out the idea that the only reason they are trying him for these murders is because they are desperate. They don't have anyone else to stick the, the blame on and it's just an attempt to scapegoat the client his client being Robert. And the defence said that although Robert, you know, has paedophilic fantasies, that doesn't make him a murderer. His defence did not allow Robert to testify on his own behalf in relation to the petrol receipts and travel records and the defence told the jury that's because no man can be expected to remember the ordinary daily routine of his life going back many years. And to support this idea that the three murders were not part of a series that had been committed by Robert, much of the testimony delivered by the defence witnesses referred to sightings of alternative suspects and suspicious vehicles nearer to each station. So they were literally just trying to Obviously, they have got to only just create reasonable doubt. Like, that's all they have to do. Reasonable doubt is enough. If the jury have reasonable doubt that he, you know, maybe didn't do these murders, they don't have to... They can't sentence him. On the 12th of May, both counsels delivered their closing arguments to the jury. Prosecutor John Milford argued first, opening his final address to the jury by describing, again, the circumstances of Robert's 1990 arrest and recounting the extensive circumstantial evidence presented throughout the trial and emphasising the fact that no physical evidence existed due to the interval between the offences and Robert's arrest. In reference to the defence argument that Robert's close proximity to each of the abduction and body disposal sites of the dates in question was a mere coincidence, he stated that if his defence's contentions were true, he said, quote, that it would be the coincidence to end all coincidences. <laughs> it's so true. Milford then requested that the jury reach a guilty verdict. Then the defence, Ronald, delivered his closing arguments on behalf of the defence. He began by asking the jury, quote, where is the jury that will acquit a pervert of mo multiple murder? Before describing Robert as someone against whom ample prejudice existed, but no hard evidence. Ronald pressed upon the jury the necessity to differentiate between a child sex pervert and an alleged child killer. Before attacking the credibility of several prosecution witnesses, and pouring particular scorn upon the nationwide manhunt, stating, quote, the police have become exhausted in not finding anyone. The public are clamouring for a result. What good are you if you can't catch a child killer? Is he their salvation or a convenient, expendable scapegoat? Ronald then referred to the defence witness testimony, which indicated someone else had committed these three murders, and then he rested his case. I'm sorry, this is the worst defence. I mean, oh my god. It's so hard being a defence lawyer. Judge Matheson delivered his final instructions to the jury on the 16th of May. In his final address, the judge implored the jury to discard any emotion or personal distaste for Robert's extensive history of sexual offences against children when considering their verdict and not to prejudge his guilt because of his current conviction. The jury then received strict instructions against reading newspapers, watching television or making any telephone calls before retiring to consider the verdict. And these deliberations continued for two days. On the 19th of May, the jury found Robert Black guilty of three counts of kidnapping, three counts of murder, three counts of preventing the lawful the lawful burial of a body and, in relation to Theresa Thornhill, one count of attempted abduction. He was sentenced to a term life imprisonment for each of these counts with a recommendation that he serve a minimum of 35 years on each of the three murder charges and they were to be served concurrently. The judge described Robert as being the perpetrator of, quote, offences which are unlikely ever to be forgotten and which re represent a man at his most vile. Robert remained completely unmoved during hearing his sentence, but as he prepared to leave the dock, he turned to the detectives that were leading this manhunt they had been investigating since 1982, and he literally said, quote, Tremendous. Well done, boys. And this statement caused several of the detectives to weep. Robert was then taken to Wakefield Prison to begin his sentence in the segregation unit as a Category A prisoner. After, Hector Clark stated, quote, The tragedy is these three beautiful children who should have never have died. Robert is the most evil of characters and I hope there is not now or ever another one like him. And when asked his personal feelings about Robert Black, Clark stated, quote, Robert is a man of the most evil kind, but no longer important to me. I do not care about him. Which I think is amazing. Like, he... That... 
Clark did all he could to get him convicted for all of this and get the, the victim's family's justice in a way. Like, even though Robert was going to be in life in prison anyway for that abduction, Clark did not give up. He did not give up. He wanted him done. He wanted to get, you know, some sort of justice for the families. Now, on the 15th of December 2009, Robert was served with a summons to attend trial in Northern Ireland for the 1981 murder of Jennifer Cardi, and he was charged the following day. So remember, this was not originally linked to the other three murders. So the trial of Robert Black for the sexual assault and murder of Jennifer Cardi began at Armagh Crown Court on 22nd of September 2011. And Robert did acknowledge that he possibly could have been in Northern Ireland on the date of Jennifer's murder, but he pleaded not guilty. Just like in his 1994 trial for the other three murders, all of the documents from his work and his schedule, you know, petrol receipts were brought back up. The prosecutor began by saying that Robert's own signature of these petrol receipts was as close as they could get or as good as they could get as signing his own confession. On the day of her abduction, it was, you know, it was pretty much slam dunk. Robert had been exactly delivering posters to that area. Like, it was so obvious. And Robert was actually only one out of two workers at the company that were willing to travel to Northern Ireland. And this, they looked into other people and they were eliminated, basically. They also compared how similar it was to Sarah Harper's murder being left in a lake. They were both found drowned. This murder trial actually lasted six weeks and the jury deliberated for only four hours. Can you believe that? That's so short. Before delivering their verdict, on the 26th of October, he was found guilty of Jennifer Cardi's abduction, sexual assault and murder. Robert was then given a further life sentence with a minimum of 25 years. The judge informed Robert, quote, your crime was particularly serious. You subjected a vulnerable child to unpardonable terror and took away her life. And at his sentencing, Robert was informed that he would be at least 89 but he, before he would even be considered for release. Like, he's never getting out, let's just say. So, police do strongly believe that Robert has killed more people but he is not gonna be, you know, tried for them. There's not enough evidence, basically. And in 2008, the Crown Prosecution Sur Service stated that insufficient evidence existed to charge Robert with any further murders. Robert has been linked to 13 child murders and disappearances across the UK, Ireland, and Europe between 1969 and 1987. There are a few more in the UK, and there's one more in Ireland. There's one in Germany in 1985, which was when Robert was in Germany delivering and there's even one in the Netherlands there is four suspected victims in France each of those times Robert was in France the aftermath eight-year nationwide inquiry into the 1990 arrest of Robert Black was one of the longest most exhaustive and costly British murder investigations of the 20th century the total cost of this inquiry is estimated to be 12 million pound Robert has actually appealed his sentence but it never came to anything thank god and also in july 1995 robert was attacked in his cell at wakefield prison by two fellow inmates yes. they threw ball boiling water mixed with sugar over him bludgeoned him with a table leg then then stabbed him in the back and neck with an improvised knife robert sustained superficial wounds burns and bruising in the attack his attackers were jailed jailed for three further years after admitting wounding robert with intent to call a cause grievous bodily harm. Robert never admitted any culpability in the murders, still to this day. He's described as a person that is all about power and control and having the information about the things he's done, but he's not going to give up, gives him that control and that power. Robert, thankfully, died from a heart attack in HMP Magaberry on the 12th of January 2016. He was a about to be charged with the murder of a girl called Jeanette Tate, which is one of his ones that he was suspected of. He was cremated at Rose Lawn Crematorium outside Belfast, 29th of January. No family or friends were present, and in February 2016, his ashes were scattered at sea. The fact that he gets a nice, you know, still a quite a nice goodbye is a bit annoying. The victims' families didn't, but anyway that is the end of today's video i hope you liked listening to me tell you this case probably didn't like it it's absolutely traumatizing but you know what i mean learning like i always say my heart goes out to the victims in this case and their families i know they're not gonna be watching but i just want to say that because it, it 
it's something that someone like you and me can't imagine because it hasn't happened to us it hasn't happened to someone we love it hasn't happened to our child like not that i have a child but i'm just set giving examples you can't imagine it you can't wrap your head around it and it's absolutely devastating he's a sick man and it's a shame that it took so long to catch him but at least they did at least they did and they tried really hard. The police work in this case, I feel like, was really, really good. I, like, compared to a lot of other cases, the police work was very good, in my opinion. So, well done. But, yes. Please go comment down below your opinions on this case. And give it a like. It means the world. And subscribe. And, yeah, I will see you all next Wednesday for a new video.